Hi, welcome to the Bell Foundation webinar. My name is Caroline Bruce. I'm one of the training managers at the Bell Foundation and I'll be your e-moderator today. Let me introduce our speaker, Sharka Piggott. Sharka is also a training manager at the Bell Foundation. She's worked in language education since 2002 as a teacher of English as a foreign language, an academic manager and a teacher trainer. Her professional interests include teacher development, second language acquisition, helping learners develop receptive skills and project-based learning. Over to you, Sharka. Thank you, Caroline. And hello, everyone. It's lovely to see people joining us from a range of places in the UK and uh, abroad as well. Um, so uh, the aim for today's webinar is to explore why it's important to teach writing and what learners need to master to become proficient writers. We'll look at five key principles for the teaching of academic writing to multilingual learners. Um, we'll also then look at a framework for the teaching of writing to multilingual learners, which combines content and language learning. And the hope is that you will be better equipped to support your learners in developing their academic writing skills. And as a result, your multilingual learners can maximize their performance in all subjects and achieve their academic potential. Um, so the plan for the session is as follows. And uh, at the start, um, I wanted to really explain or clarify that although a lot of what we'll cover today is applicable to learners at all levels of proficiency, uh, the main focus will be on more advanced learners. And uh, well, what do I mean by that? Um, by that, I mean learners uh, from the high end of band C, developing competence upwards. So anyone who's in the competent or even the fluent uh, band. And I've decided to focus on the more advanced learners, partly because support for this group is often limited, as you may well know, especially you know, where there are higher numbers of students with lower levels of proficiency or in English, for obvious reasons, their needs um, might seem more urgent and the needs of more advanced multilingual students uh, therefore take less of a priority um, than those who struggle to understand the curriculum. Um, it's also important to remember that the group of more advanced learners includes often second generation EAL learners who were born in the UK and um, as we know, these learners typically pass their GCSEs, but perhaps in some cases don't get as good a pass as they are capable of. So it's important to remember that even learners at Band D need to receive some support to help them extend their English language competence to the higher levels of which they are capable. And uh, it's also important to remember that many learners who use EAL will have spiky profiles. I think we're all well aware of that. For example, there might be learners who are fluent in speaking and listening, but not as proficient and in reading and writing, although the very opposite may well be true in some cases as well. And uh, the learner's fluency may also mask limitations in some areas of language development, for example, in their vocabulary knowledge. As Lynn Cameron points out, the support needs of bilingual learners do not cease once they become orally proficient in English. It's common for pupils learning English as a second language to achieve reasonable levels um, of, sp of fl spoken fluency after 18 months to two years, but becoming skilled readers and writers in a second or third or additional language generally takes considerably longer. Um, so that's a brief explanation of why the focus on more advanced learners. And in the next section, I'll briefly explore the reasons why it's important to teach writing. So in many cases, and I hope you would agree with me, uh, writing is a neglected skill. Um, as Graham points out, many children across the world do not receive the writing instruction at school that they deserve or need. And there are many reasons for this, including varying perceptions about the importance of teaching writing, for example, 
It could be the teacher's lack of training or confidence in their ability to teach writing effectively. It could be the fact that writing is a complex and challenging task that requires a large amount of classroom time or possibly the fact that there's no single agreed on set of skills, knowledge or processes for teaching writing. And it may also be that some subject teachers are not confident about the language demands of their subject and therefore find it difficult to explain the language and model this to their learners. However, writing is a key skill to teach. It's a skill that does not develop naturally and therefore needs to be taught explicitly. And this applies to all learners, whether they're learning to write in their first or additional language. And writing is also a skill which plays an integral role in the education of all learners, as we all know. I don't think we've got the time today to go into too much detail, but we know that writing enhances learners' performance in all subjects. They understand and retain material when asked to write about it. Writing also forms the medium by which learners' understanding of curriculum content is typically assessed, and again, therefore a key skill. Writing improves the learners' reading skills, as reading and writing share a close and reciprocal relation because they rely on common knowledge and processes. And writing definitely is a key skill to students' future success. So it's therefore crucial that all learners are equipped with the knowledge and skills necessary to understand the writing forms they are expected to engage with at school, and also that they are given appropriate training in replicating those forms. And we've already mentioned that writing is a very complex skill, but I wanted to have a closer look at what it is that learners have to master to become proficient writers. One way to look at this is to consider the three different levels, the level of the word, the sentence and the whole text. To become proficient writers at the word level, learners need to have a sufficiently developed knowledge of vocabulary, by which I mean individual words, but also phrases and chunks of language. And to be able to use a vocabulary item successfully, they need to know its meaning and use, as well as its form in writing the spelling. And in the case of academic writing, that requires knowledge of both general and academic vocabulary, including genre-specific words and phrases. So that's already quite a lot. And then we come to the sentence level, at which learners need to be able to combine words into meaningful sentences, which in turn involves a thorough knowledge of grammar. And finally, at the text level, students need to be able to combine sentences into coherent and cohesive paragraphs and texts. And they also have to um, or need to have an in-depth knowledge about different types of texts and their genre conventions. Let's have a look at an example from a history lesson. Uh, so to be able to write a historical recount on waves of migration to the UK, one thing learner will need to do at the level of text is to be able to describe a chronological sequence um, of uh, events. At the sentence level, uh, they will need to uh, be able to use the past tense, time connectives um, and uh, similar uh, expressions. And at the level of the word, uh, they will need to know phrases such as in the 1950s, prior to that, around then, and many more. So it is quite a lot um, to master to be able to write a historical recount. Another way to look at writing and the processes involved is to consider the three different processes which writers need to combine and which make writing such a demanding skill. Um, you can see in this diagram, uh, one of the processes is transcription. So students need to be able to transcribe, physically write or type, which can be a very challenging task to do if you're learning to write in a different script, for example. They must be able to compose, 
i.e. generate ideas and translate them into words, sentences and structured texts. And finally, they must also use executive functions, processes such as planning, reviewing, redrafting and so on. And all these processes place a heavy burden on the working memory, even in our first language, but even more so in an additional language where the transcription and composition processes may be far from automatic. Um, so indeed a very challenging and complex skill to master. And one more thing to bear in mind is that the academic challenges faced by students both in their first and additional language, moving from primary to secondary are all often underestimated. Um, you will all know that they suddenly need to work with a range of new text types, which are often dense and more technical than those that they encountered in primary school. Um, an analysis of language demands at key stage two and key stage three, which was carried out by Dayton um, and colleagues and published uh, earlier this year, found out uh, that the following areas are amongst the top ones which may cause difficulty for transitioning students. Register features are one of them and Polysemy uh, featured a lot. The fact that the vocabulary that the students had encountered previously suddenly take on new meanings at key stage three. And there were other areas such as, uh, um, you know, the, just the sheer volume of text that students have to process when they join secondary school. And these challenges can create something we can call a literacy gap meaning that many students making the transition from primary struggle to access the secondary school curriculum. Well, although, as Victoria Murphy points out, writing remains an area of neglect in the research field of EAL, we know that learners who use EAL face multiple challenges which are not shared by their monolingual peers. Um, Research done by Professor Lynn Cameron to investigate the areas for development in the writing of more advanced bilingual learners showed difficulties in the following areas. The first one is the knowledge of genre, which in EAL learners was more inconsistent than in their monolingual peers. Their paragraphing was poor. Um, learners were not able to express their ideas clearly or their ideas lacked detail. Usage at word and phrase level was often incorrect. For example, there were errors um, in the use of modal verbs to indicate probability or possibility. Um, their range of vocabulary was also narrower than that of their monolingual peers. Um, this included difficulties with polysemy that we said earlier um, is one of the areas of difficulty, i.e. knowing the meaning of a word in different contexts. Errors in punctuation were common as well. And finally, uh, as you may well know from your own experience, errors in subject verb agreements were also more common in learners using EAL. And although the advanced bilingual learners in the research that I've just quoted um, had been in the UK education for an average of 10 years and had therefore had most of their schooling in the UK, these writing errors persisted into key stage four. So now that we know what some of the challenges are, how can we as teachers best support our multilingual learners to develop their academic writing skills? Well, let's explore five key principles that research tells us that teachers should bear in mind. But um, before we do that, I would like to ask you to share your top tip for teaching writing to EA learners. If a less experienced colleague asks you what the most important thing to do or bear in mind was, what would you tell them? Can you please share your answers in the chat? Yes, writing takes time. Talk about it first. Use of oracy, something that we'll talk about using their first language, a very important key point, modeling, 
vocabulary, writing frames, um, yeah, modeling, teaching keywords, sentence starters, translanguaging. Yeah, I see a lot of modeling, which is definitely one of the things that we will be talking about later. Use of the student's first or preferred language. Yeah, different um, strategies such as using substitution tables, sentence starters. You, yes, talk before writing, which is again something that we will talk about later. Yes, uh, a lot of ideas, I think, which are in line with what I'll be talking about later. So it's good that we seem to be on the same page. Um, it, the importance of vocabulary is also something that I will be mentioning later. Um, so thank you very much for your suggestions or your top tips. Uh, let me share um, the first principle, which is uh, prioritizing disciplinary literacy across the curriculum. That might sound a little bit scary, but it draws on the guidance document on improving literacy in secondary schools published by the EF. And it's equally relevant to first language, uh, English language speakers and multilingual learners. And by disciplinary literacy, um, they mean an approach to improving literacy across the curriculum. And it's an approach that will be useful for both L1 and L2 English speakers. It recognizes that literacy skills are both general and subject specific, and is therefore essential that teachers of all subjects teach students to read, write, and communicate effectively in their subjects so that students can access the academic language um, of different subjects. We could think about this as teaching our students to write like an expert in our own subject. And to achieve this, students need their language learning to be contextualized. And for advanced learners in particular, I think this is much more easily achieved in the subject classroom than in a withdrawal session, for example, um, because the lesson itself provides the context for their language learning. The second principle I wanted to share is uh, providing explicit targeted vocabulary instruction in every subject. And some of you did mention vocabulary as a key skill. And again, it's one that's important for both first and second uh, language English speakers. Um, but uh, vocabulary development, and in particular academic vocabulary development, is absolutely essential for learners who use EAL to be able to produce high quality written academic texts. As Victoria Murphy and colleagues put it, Vocabulary must form a part of any explicit focus on teaching writing to EA learners, and her claim is supported by multiple other studies. And in accordance with the first principle that we mentioned, disciplinary literacy, it's key that teachers in every subject provide explicit vocabulary instruction um, to help students access and use the academic language in that particular subject. It can just be the role of the EAL teacher, for example, um, teachers in every subject need to help EAL learners achieve that goal. And you might be wondering what vocabulary to focus on, as the choice is almost endless. Um, well, firstly, it's important to consider in advance which vocabulary, and again, by that I mean individual words, but also phrases and chunks of language, your students will need to learn. This should be considered as part of your lesson planning, both short and medium term. And when making decisions, considering the three tiers of vocabulary might be helpful. I think you're probably all familiar with these, but uh, just a very quick reminder, if not, tier one are everyday words and phrases such as table, ruler, beat. Tier two, general academic vocabulary, which is used across disciplines. So for example, words like compare, describe, whereas, and so on. And finally, tier three are subject specific words, which are usually defined for use in a specific subject area. For example, photosynthesis would be an example of a tier three word. 
And with tier two and three words, it's important to remember that the same word may have different meanings in different subjects. Like here, we've got volume, um, different meanings in different subjects. Uh, so for example, volume used in a chemistry lesson would have a very different meaning to volume used in music. And we've already discussed that policy is one of the areas of difficulty for most students transitioning into secondary, but it can be especially confusing to learners whose first language is not English. And this brings us back to the point that teachers of all subjects need to actively develop their students' language skills. And I would say that teachers often focus on teaching tier three words and phrases, which are certainly important, uh, but for the development of students' academic writing, it's equally important to teach tier two words, i.e. the general academic words and phrases that are used across disciplines. But tier two includes, again, a vast amount of words. Um, so you can reduce um, this and decide which ones you should be focusing on primarily by interrogating the language of your subject by looking at textbooks, exam papers, and so on. And another useful tool you may want to consider uh, to decide which vocabulary items to focus on is the academic word list developed by Professor Coxhead of Victoria University of Wellington. In case uh, you're not familiar with it, the academic word list is a list of 570 words that appear frequently in all academic texts, i.e. tier two academic words. And the list is divided into 10 sublists according to how frequent the words are, which is a very useful uh, tool. Sublist one has the most frequent words and sublist 10 the least frequent words. And this can definitely help inform your choice of which words you want to focus on. For example, band C learners will likely need to be taught the most frequent words. So the ones that have a one or a two next to them on this um, image you can see. Uh, but band D or E learners can probably focus on words which are in the higher sublists. But when using the academic word list, it's important to remember that these 570 words are in fact just head words. So they are the most common words within a word family. That means that there may be many more related words that students will also need to understand and learn. For example, the head word of one family is conclusion, but students obviously will need to learn and be able to use words like conclude, conclusive, inconclusive, and so on. So there is a lot of vocabulary that needs to be covered. And this leads me to another key point, and that's the importance of explicitly focusing on word morphology, i.e. the study of the structure and parts of words, such as prefixes and suffixes, and word etymology, the study of the origin of words. In terms of morphology, it's very useful to make learners aware of common suffixes, which are used to create nouns, adjectives, etc. To use the previous example, conclusion, for example, includes the common noun suffix n, and the adjectives conclusive and inconclusive have the common suffix if. Um, and similarly, it's helpful to explicitly teach the meaning of common prefixes, for example, anti meaning against or miss, having the meaning of doing something badly or wrongly, for example, misunderstand or misbehave because this will not only support students' writing skills, but also their reading. They will be able to understand a wider range of vocabulary or you know, guess the meaning. If they know at least the meaning of the prefix, the suffix, they can take a better guess. And practice of uh, words like this can be provided in a number of ways, including games. For example, loop games. Here's an example of a loop game for an English lesson where learners are given cards, which you can see here, um, to practice turning adjectives into nouns. And as regards etymology, i.e. the origin of words, 
For example, in English literature, you might want to explicitly explain the uh, etymology of the word trilogy from the Greek tree and logos, three stories, and maybe also explore words which include tree or tri that students know from different subjects, triangle from maths or music, triple, etc. And this would also be a good opportunity to draw on your learner's full linguistic repertoire. We've already mentioned, or you have mentioned, the importance of using the student's first language and encourage them to make comparisons with the other languages they know, because there may well be similarities. Um, okay. Right, and moving on to principle number three, which is combining writing instruction with reading in every subject. This is essential for a number of reasons, um, but first it's likely to improve skills in both areas. Um, reading helps students gain knowledge which leads to better writing, whilst writing can deepen students' understanding of ideas. And thirdly, students should be taught to recognize features, aims and conventions of good writing within each subject. And that is best done through the active reading of such good models. And we'll have a look, uh, a closer look at this uh, later on. And principle number four is something which quite a few of you mentioned earlier, and that's including the planned use of oracy to develop the learner's writing skills. Because as we all know, talk is a powerful tool for learning and literacy. And among other benefits, it can improve reading and writing outcomes. As Beverly Derevianka points out, a major challenge that uh, faces learners, and I would say especially learners who use EAL, is the move from the free-flowing, spontaneous language of the spoken mode towards the denser, more compact language of the written mode encountered in academic contexts. Um, but rather than thinking of spoken and written or social and academic English as two distinct entities, I'd say it's better to think of them as lying on a continuum. And I've got a task for you. Um, here, I will give you shortly show you uh, examples from Pauline Gibbons. Four utterances, could you read them and in the chat box tell me how the language changes across the continuum from the left to the right? So how does the language change from the left to the right? So thank you, Phyllis. From informal to formal becomes more formal, says Ed. Um, registrant fluency, yeah, it formalizes from personal to impersonal, social to academic. Vocabulary becomes higher level, yes. More detailed, more impersonal, more academic vocabulary, more complex clauses. Yes, exactly. I think all the answers I've managed to see um, are correct. Uh, someone's mentioned nominalizations as well. Yes, as we can see, you know, whether we want to call it social or informal or spontaneous on the left hand side, the language moves to more academic, more formal, more technical. We can see that the utterance on the left is very fragmented, uses simple sentences, as so many of you pointed out, and often refers to the immediate context, you know, using um, pronouns this, that, these. And on the other hand, the utterance on the right, which is taken from a children's encyclopedia, is much more formal, as some of you have mentioned, uses more technical terminology, as we could say, more advanced vocabulary, definitely more complex sentences and language features such as nominalization in the last sentence. Um, and um, well, both ends of the continuum play different roles in the learning process. We can't say that one is more important than the other one because at the spoken end, 
Um, language allows students to explore the subject matter in a context that provides support, both from the physical setting, but also from the other participants. So they can ask questions, get feedback and ask for clarification, for example. But at the written end of the continuum, learners have to take responsibility for constructing the text on their own. And it's therefore important to remember, as we said, that oracy plays an integral role in the writing development of EAA learners. And teachers can support EAA learners in becoming more effective writers through carefully planned spoken language activities, such as class discussions and debates, exploratory talk, and so on. And teachers should also use a range of activities and approaches to highlight how language changes according to whether it's spoken or written, uh, according to where it lies on the continuum. This again highlights the importance of drawing the learner's explicit attention to language in subject lessons. For example, a teacher could be asking questions such as these, you know, what kind of language do you think we'll need to use for this task? What type of words do you think we'll need? Can we use informal language uh, or do we need to be more formal in this particular task? Um, um, so, you know, it is important to focus on language explicitly. And uh, that leads me to the fifth and last principle, which is teaching writing explicitly. We've already explored um, uh, and discussed, uh, you know, why writing is an incredibly complex process. And research does show that students in all subjects will benefit from explicit writing instruction. To make it more accessible to more learners, but I'd say especially multilingual ones, it's important to break down the complex writing process into more manageable chunks. For example, focusing on planning in one lesson or monitoring and evaluation of your writing and supporting students by modeling each step. And to develop students' planning skills, for example, graphic organizers can be a useful tool. And it's also key to provide word level, sentence level, and whole text level instruction, um, because there is evidence to suggest that by focusing on the micro elements of writing for longer, students will ultimately be able to write longer, higher quality responses. And we will look at some of these areas in more detail in the next part of the webinar. But first of all, here's a summary of the five principles. So disciplinary literacy across the curriculum, targeted vocabulary instruction, combining writing with reading in every subject, combining writing and speaking or planned use of oracy, and finally teaching writing explicitly. And in the next and final part of uh, the webinar, I wanted to look at a possible framework that can be used for the teaching of writing to learners who use EAL. And that's based around the principles that we've just discussed. Now, the framework is the teaching and learning cycle. Um, uh, some of you may already be familiar with, uh, as suggested by Beverly Jarabianka. There are four stages in this cycle. First, building knowledge of the field, modeling the genre or text type, guided practice, and finally, independent practice. So let's look at the first stage, which is building knowledge of the field. By this, we mean developing students' subject knowledge. Um, that's especially important for learners who use EAL, because if you remember, we mentioned earlier that EAL learners' writing is often characterized by lack of content or lack of ideas. And it's also important to remember that the knowledge of the field includes cultural references. We can't assume that all learners have the same shared knowledge. And even learners whose um, language level is advanced are likely to need explicit explanations of certain culturally bound concepts or topics. Um, for example, 
discussions around social classes in Britain or the role of women at the time of Austen's life when studying Pride and Prejudice. You know, on a personal note, I, I have studied English for most of my life and I've been living in the UK for 15 years, but I still find that there are cultural references in literature, the media, films and so on, that I still don't understand fully. So that's one important thing to bear in mind. And building the learner's knowledge of the field can be achieved through a number of activities and approaches, such as reading around the subject, for example, using other media such as videos to support content knowledge or a teacher-led class discussion. And the reading text and videos can either be provided by the teacher, but higher proficiency learners can also be encouraged to research the topic independently, for example, in groups, using the internet, encyclopedias, other books, and so on. And this stage is again an opportunity to allow learners to use their full linguistic repertoire, i.e., for example, carry out the research in their preferred language if they wish. Um, information gap activities, uh, where different levels have different bits of information and they have to convey these orally to each other, are also a great um, resource at this stage as they provide plenty of opportunity for developing subject knowledge, but also for developing the language associated with it. And one of the key benefits uh, is that language is learned in a meaningful context for a particular purpose. Um, information gap activities uh, are, for example, jigsaw reading, where several learners read different texts around the same topic, or, for example, different parts of the same text, and they have to work together to collate all key information. Another useful resource at this stage is graphic organizers. They can be used to show the relationship between key ideas and to help learners organize content knowledge in preparation for writing. Here's an example of a graphic organizer looking at reasons for the decline in wildflowers. Um, you can see each branch um, has a reason, but we can also include details for each course um, you know, which could be a good tool for summarizing and reviewing complex information. And the organizer could be provided by the teacher, but I would suggest that higher proficiency learners would ideally complete it themselves as they research the topic, whether individually or in collaboration with others. And another useful approach is to provide visual support related to the subject and topic in the form of diagrams or schematics, such as these examples that support the understanding of the water cycle or the stages in the process of recycling plastic. And as with graphic organizers, higher level learners would ideally be asked to label the diagrams as they research the topic rather than the teacher providing the labels. Well, it goes without saying that at this stage of the cycle, teachers will also need to help learners develop their vocabulary related to the topic by explicitly teaching it. We've already discussed in some detail how to decide what vocabulary to prioritize, but here I just wanted to highlight the importance of teaching vocabulary in context, which will hopefully be provided by the text that the students engage with at this stage and the importance of focusing on chunks of language that includes phrases, collocations, and so on, rather than just isolated words. And it's also key to ensure that learners record new language uh, because um, it will help retention and obviously it's, it's a useful revision tool. Um, as mentioned earlier, it's also useful to explicitly discuss word etymology, morphology, as well as word classes and spelling patterns, for example. Um, one way for learners to record vocabulary can be Freya diagrams. Here we've got an example um, to, for learners to learn the word erosion, 
and related words. The basic structure of the Freya diagram can easily be adapted to include the learner's first language, for example. Here we've got the learner making notes in Czech, and it's also a good opportunity to focus on chunks of language by recording common collocations. Um, for example, here we've got collocations such as coastal erosion or soil erosion as very common ones and to explore words in the same family. So here we've got the verb to erode and also the adjective. And finally, learners can also see how to use the word in a sentence, which I personally think um, really helps um, learners be able to use the word, not just uh, understand it passively, but to be use it um, in the right context. And in terms of their production, at this stage of the teaching and learning cycle, students are likely to operate near the spoken end of the mode continuum that we discussed earlier. For example, when researching a topic collaboratively or when participating in a class discussion or talking with a peer whilst conducting an experiment in a science lesson, their language is likely to be spoken more informal. And it's important that teachers provide opportunities for exploratory talk, which will allow pupils to use their own ideas and make connections with prior knowledge and thinking through experimenting or problem solving. It may be helpful to provide scaffolding at this stage to develop the students deeper thinking skills, for example, providing sentence stems for the language of agreement or polite disagreement phrases such as one reason this might not work is <laughs> that would, will allow the learners to focus on the content of what they're trying to say rather than the form. Well, and now let's move on to the second stage, which is modeling the genre or type of writing we want our learners to be able to use. Um, during this stage, learners look at successful models of writing in the genre they're expected to adopt, and they're guided to read these intensively. The, uh, the aim of this stage is to raise the learners' awareness of things such as how the texts are organized, their structure and typical stages, as well as key language features. As we said earlier, it's key that teachers of all subjects do this because different subjects often adopt different genres. Um, and when, again, when it comes to deciding what features of a particular text type um, need to be modeled, we can again consider the three levels, um, the level of the whole text. This would include the structure and organization of paragraphs the level of the sentence and the level of the word or a phrase. And uh, some suggested activities could be, for example, students completing a graphic organizer to show how a text or paragraph is structured, such as in this example, which focuses on the structure of an argument essay. Highlighting or color coding essential parts of the text or a paragraph is another useful activity. Students could be asked, for example, to highlight each cause and its effect in a cause effect essay or connectives which are used to express a causal relationship such as therefore, as a consequence and others. And it goes without saying that once they have highlighted these, they need to be taught how to use them appropriately. When focusing on the level of the paragraph, students could be asked to highlight the topic sentence of each paragraph, for example, or depending on the type of the text, the topic sentence, the body sentences, and a final sentence, like in this paragraph. And the purpose of each of these sentences could then be discussed in more detail, followed up by students attempting to write their own paragraph, on a different topic. And um, active reading strategies, that's activities intended to help pupils make active use of a text, should be encouraged at this stage too. For example, students could be given cut up paragraphs of the model text and asked to put them back in the correct order. 
this would allow them to focus on the structure and organization, the level of the whole text. Or the students could be given jumbled up sentences uh, which form a paragraph and again asked to put them in the correct order. Like in this example, which is a paragraph from an encyclopedia about cotton. Um, at the sentence level, you may wish to focus on grammatical patterns that are typical of the text type, for example. In a chemistry lab report, which we have here, after having looked at a couple of examples together, students may be asked to highlight all examples of the passive voice, followed by a discussion about why and in which situations the passive is used. At the level of the word or phrase, you could draw your students' attention to specific language patterns or lexical chunks that are typical of the genre. For example, in an opinion essay, students could be asked to highlight all phrases used to introduce the writer's opinion. You know, things such as there's no doubt that or one cannot deny that. Um, for advanced students, focusing on hedging language, i.e. how the writer expresses caution or uncertainty could be of use because it's quite typical of English uh, academic writing. And in the chemistry lab report that we mentioned a moment ago, the focus could be on useful phrases such as, um, you know, which could be used across different reports, such as in this experiment, X was investigated, or the results of the experiment show that. Um, in another example, use for language for describing data could be the focus. For example, figure one shows the relationships between A and B or possible sources of error in this experiment include X. And an excellent way uh, to share a model text with the students and help them notice the key language features is certainly dictogloss. Um, for those who are not familiar with the term, dictogloss is a type of dictation activity where the students listen to a text which is read at normal speed, they take notes and then they recreate it as closely to the original as possible. The text is normally read more than once and students can recreate the text in pairs or small groups. They then compare it to the original and the aim is for them to notice the gap between what they have produced and the model text, um, thus drawing attention to specific language features. And I, I would say the beauty of dictogloss and the reason I loved using it as a teacher is that it requires very little or no preparation on the part of the teacher, apart from identifying a suitable text, whilst providing very, very useful practice for the students. So here we've got an example of the teacher reading out the text, students are listening and taking notes, and then they are working together in small groups to recreate the text. And I'd say that dictogloss is better used with shorter texts, perhaps up to 150 words, and therefore it can be a good way to explicitly guide learners in responding to exam questions and using structures which are common in written responses to exam questions, such as the language of explanation, as in this example from geography, GCSE. And in subjects which have marks for spelling, punctuation and grammar, well, but not just them, um, dictogloss can also be useful in drawing the student's attention towards those features. So it's very useful for focusing on language, but also text structure and organization. Well, and now let's move on to the third stage in the cycle, which is guided practice. A stepping stone between the two initial stages and finally being able to produce the target written text independently. During the um, guided practice stage, learners tend to work collaboratively to recreate a piece of writing in the genre that's being studied. And the teacher acts as a guide, helping learners to develop their understanding of the thought processes that successful writers go through. 
Um, it is a key stage because it allows the teacher as the more experienced writer to make the thinking processes involved in writing explicit for pupils. The teacher is not only modeling the writing process, but the thinking processes behind it. And during this stage, the teacher will need to ask a variety of questions to help learners understand the choices that effective writers make um, when they are constructing a piece of text. For example, when writing a historical recount, the teacher could be asking questions such as, you know, how should we start? What information would you include um, in the first paragraph? Or this is an event that happened before another event in the past. What tense should we be using here? And in this example, the class could write the first paragraph of the recount together and the students would be suggesting the wording of the paragraph, the teacher would be writing their suggestions on the board, and it would require quite extensive negotiation and some redrafting. And after, students could be divided into pairs or small groups and asked to write the next paragraph together, encouraged to talk to each other about what they were going to write and how. And the teacher would monitor and provide feedback to each group is they asking them to revise um, the text where necessary. It's also an opportunity for the teacher to encourage the learners to move away from tier one language, more typical of speaking, and make more academic language choices. So a very important stage. And once the guided practice stage is complete, the students will, will hopefully be ready to produce their own texts independently. And this stage should build on all the previous ones. Students should use any notes, graphic organizers or diagrams they had produced when building their knowledge of the field um, in the first stage. And they should also refer back to what they've learned about the organization of the text and its key language structure. For example, they could use the same graphic organizer as earlier to help, their write, help them write their own argument essay. Um, you know, and it's important to remember that even higher level learners are likely to still need some support if writing a text type that's new to them. And such support could be provided in the form of sentence starters or writing frames perhaps included within a graphic organizer, as in this example, uh, which would help them with the structure, but also um, the beginning of each paragraph. This could, of course, be prepared before a lesson and hopefully reused many, many times, but it could also be quickly um, constructed together, written out on the board during the lesson where preparation time um, is at a premium. And when we ask students to create a text independently, it's also useful to set, or even better, I'd say negotiate, success criteria which their text should meet. And the success criteria can refer to the content, the length, the organization, and of course, any key language features. Um, and the success criteria could then be used for self-assessment or peer assessment, which can be an extremely impactful approach. And it could also help learners edit or redraft their text as needed. So in summary, uh, we've seen that the teaching and learning cycle allows teachers to focus explicitly on teaching writing in the context of what is being studied in the subject classroom. Therefore, teaching writing uh, in this approach does not come at the expense of teaching content, but supports it instead. Um, we have reached the end of uh, the presentation. Here are the references which we will share together with the recording uh, when we send it. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Caroline. Thanks, Jarka. <clears throat> we have, we've got two questions. So uh, perhaps just about enough time. So the first question is from Phyllis. How important is spelling in terms of acquiring vocabulary? Should we insist on 100% accuracy when we come to write at text level? 
it's not uncommon second language learners blend in with their first language sounds and spelling words in English. Should teachers be more tolerant of these? Mm, that's a very good question. I would say if we're ta talking about more advanced um, bilingual learners, I would probably in most cases insist on correct spelling as well to push them um, because they should already or they will already have a good command of English. So as a way of pushing their performance even higher, I would. I think unless um, my aim for the lesson was focusing on the structure of an essay or a text, for example, um, because when giving feedback, I think on a text, we, we can't focus on everything. Um, you know, the hope is that with higher level learners, there will be fewer errors or things to point out. And therefore, maybe you could cover both the text organization and spelling. Um, but I think it depends here yeah, on the aim of the activity. I think if, if the aim is for them to write a coherent paragraph on a topic, then I think that would be my primary focus, but I might still point out some spelling issues where I feel that at their level, they should be able to spell those words correctly. And obviously in, you know, in exams like GCSEs, um, in, in those subjects that, that do look at spelling and punctuation, you know, they, they might unnecessarily lose marks um, if their spelling is not accurate. Absolutely. Um, and Lizzie shared as well that the, sometimes uh, teaching ideas from morphology is a good way of in, uh, reinforcing spelling patterns. Um, and, and I would absolutely reiterate about um, the importance of the, the purpose of the activity as well. And the second question then very quickly has come uh, by email. I'm a secondary science teacher at Fine Barnet School. Recently, we've had lots of students using EAL during the school. I found it very difficult to differentiate lessons for mainly key stage three pupils. Can you suggest any strategies to use when planning lessons for students who are not literate in their own language? Oh, I think that, that that's exactly. a tough one. That's a really tough one to end one with. I wonder if this is one we can send some resources out to as well. I'm just looking at the time. Yes, I think it might be. I'm not sure whether, yeah, Caroline, you've got anything, any ideas, but obviously that's moving to the other end of the proficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, think sharing keywords to focus on pre-teaching and making really good use of resources that don't depend on uh, reading and writing, um, you know, in terms of using first language. I think that's a really good um, starting point, lots and lots of visuals and so on, um, and lots of scaffolding and modeling. Um, but we have got some information on the website, which I'll be able to signpost to you. Um, so that was it for the questions. Um, so thank you very much, Sharka. It was a really useful um, and informative presentation. I, and we've had lots of great uh, contributions from the uh, participants. So just quickly to let you know a few things that are coming up. Um, in the shortly, we've got some webinars. Um, if uh, So we've got some free webinars coming up. So we've got one on um, how schools can help pupils arriving from Hong Kong to settle and integrate. Um, and this is um, Thomas Benson will be joining us from uh, the welcoming committee uh, for Hong Kongers. Um, and that's on the 28th of June and is, is one of the free webinars following up from the webinars on uh, working with families from Ukraine and Afghanistan um, last year. And additionally, we have a webinar coming up on um, supporting students um, through the transition into secondary school. And that's on the 6th of July. It's following up from an article that Sarah Moody wrote for SECED and a guidance piece, which will also be uh, shared on the website. And there'll also be some case studies 
uh, from um, some of our partner schools shared during that webinar. And finally, we've got two more courses running later on this year, and they are how to adapt teaching for learners who use English as an additional language. And then finally, in October, we've got a course uh, specifically for teaching assistants. So please do check in with the on the website um, if there's uh, anything uh, you know for other courses and uh, we'll be updating those very shortly thank you very much for for joining us um i hope it's been useful you will get the recording and all of the links tomorrow and we look forward to um welcoming you again shortly <laughs>